let's begin. Um, just a quick couple of announcements. We'll do a review session this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. So attendance makes it a heck of a lot better, I can tell you that. Um, the video kind of like convinces you maybe you don't need to go and interact, but that is that session. So I'll take it however you guys want to present it to me. Uh, attendance is hardly required, but it could be helpful. So um, if you can't, Slack has been working reasonably okay, I would say. So I always like improvement, so I don't want to dwell. Uh, but if you can make it, great. If you can't, we'll make it work. Uh, I've been promising you a couple minutes back for the minute or two I steal from you all the time, so I'm actually going to fulfill my promise. No class on November the 19th. That's the Friday before Thanksgiving break. So that should be a, a useful day off. Um, I think we're doing pretty good. We're about a day or so ahead of previous uh, lectures. The path that I've taken through this is a little different than I've done in previous years. Although all the lectures that are from the, the previous year or two, we're still going to hear all that stuff. I'm just kind of working on the ordering, the best way to tell this story. The way I used to tell it was p-values are horrible in this sort of case. And I hate them, I hate them, I hate them, I don't use them, they work terribly, but in some cases they work okay. And let's see how Bayesian fixes all of this, but you need to think about a heck of a lot as a Bayesian. So I don't know if it ever comes across all the, the way that I want it to. So right now we're just kind of building up like how Bayesian thinks about it and all the things you have to think about. Um, and then we'll do the comparison of p-values later. And I'll try to not be so negative this time around, and I'll try to just explain what Naaman and Pearson said. And then I'll kind of point out it's not the way a lot of people use this stuff, which is probably where the debate shows up. I think the, the Bayesian does give you everything you need to think about, but there's issues depending on the different cases that you're studying. So I want to point out that this case versus these cases in Bayesian land feel very different. You know, in the question that you're asking, you might not even be asking this. You might not even be asking, is theta an element of this one point? And what I mean in the alternative is versus the complement. So all of my alternatives are implied from my null statement. I will point out that the Naaman Pearsonian, the, the p-value person, um, they don't think about it quite like this. They usually are doing um, one-sided tests, and then they end up looking at the most powerful point in that test. So they're looking at the set part of the space, and then they're taking the, the boundary, because it has the most power to detect. And so there's a little bit of a nuance difference, but I always kind of mean H0 versus the alternative. Remember, in a p-value, you have to like plug in a point on something. And so it's like, which point do you plug in? And usually you plug in the most powerful point. This in p-value land is a little bit hard to even think about. So because which point do you plug in? So remember what a p-value is. If you guys don't know, I'll remind you later. But it's the probability of observing your data in more extreme data given the null hypothesis. And so for this case, it's easy to plug in a point right here. On here, they do the same thing where they plug in the boundary of the point, and they usually plug in that point right here, because this has the most power to pull, most power to detect compared to the alternative, which is always on the other side of this. So you want to check the boundary. Um, in this one, we will study what the name and Pearsonian test is, i.e. the, the p-value thing for doing this test but it is a real black eye for, um, it really highlights, I guess I would say, that the p-value is not a measure of the support for the null hypothesis. But a Bayesian is always giving you a measure of support for the null hypothesis. So I'll just point out, what the Bayesian is doing is setting up belief statements of this versus its complement, or this versus its complement, or this versus its complement. And it's easy to think about. Um, a p-value is, is calibrating air rates, and that's a totally different thing. They're not belief statements. I will point out 
The Bayesian and the Neyman Pearsonian really agree in this case. We're going to give you something very similar, and we'll see that. In this case, we do not agree with each other. And in this case, um, it's almost silly how much we don't agree. So I'll try to point out all those things. Let's just do the easy ones first. For a Bayesian, these are really easy to deal with. And so let's just think about this, the one-sided case. Okay, so what you might have is H naught theta is greater than theta naught. And if you want to flip the direction, nothing will change. I'll just integrate over a different direction. You know, versus the alternative, theta is less than theta naught. Okay. And I'm going to kind of imagine maybe theta is continuous in all of these examples. And if it's not continuous, you'll change my integral sign to a sum. And you'll do the same sort of stuff. Um, it's important to think about this case as continuous. Otherwise, it's, it doesn't have all the hassles that we're usually confronted with. Please. Uh, for the sharp case, is that the same as saying theta equal to theta naught? Yeah, that's right. So this is just a point uh, right here. So theta element of just a point is theta is equal to theta. Yes. So in the one-sided case, this is actually a pretty easy thing to do for Bayesian. Um, we're not calibrating error rates per se. We're setting up belief statements. So let's just think about this as an example. So let me give you a real example. Xi's are going to come from a normal distribution with mean theta variance sigma squared. Now I've already said to you, I wouldn't test in these cases. I would just tell you what theta is if it's a one-dimensional problem. And I'm just using this example because it compares to things that you know about, that you're familiar with. This is probably the stuff that you did in your STAT 101-esque type class. And so this is just meant to highlight differences. If you were up to me and somebody said, let's learn about theta, I would say, don't do testing. Tell me what theta is. If you really needed a decision theoretic rule, we could do it. So, okay. So you have some number of data points. And we'll keep this simple where this is the unknown. That's the only thing that we're testing. And I'm going to just let all of this be really easy. And I'm going to say this is no for all of our examples. For the Bayesian and the non-Bayesian, if sigma squared wasn't known, we would do the same thing. We would be modeling things off the same t distribution. So it would be just be estimating sigma squared with s squared. We'd be plugging that thing in. The Bayesian's derivation of that and the non-Bayesian's derivation look different, but they're really the same. So the math is the same anyway. The, the spirit is maybe a little different. Okay, so this is our basic setup. And so if we're going to be a Bayesian, we need a prior. So which prior would you pick? This is the fun interactive portion of the class where I stand normal. here and you guys stare at me. <laughs> normal prior? Yeah, maybe a normal. So, so maybe theta is normally distributed and it's got some parameters in here. And so I might ask you why, and you'd say, well, it's conjugate, and all those other properties that we study. And I might ask you, how do you pick theta naught? Where do you want to center all of this stuff? Oh, I should definitely change the notation here. So I should make this theta. I'm going to put a pi right here for prior. I've already used theta naught. So, so I have to pick these right here. It's conjugate. So long as this is reasonably diffused, you're not going to be putting too much space around, too much mass where you've centered it. You might be able to think about that. Um, another good choice might be the flat prime. We have to think about can we use it. The flat prior comes as psi squared goes to infinity. So it's a limit of this conjugate prior. Um, that's the Jeffries prior. It's also the reference prior, and I will tell you the real definition later. Um, so lots of good reasons to pick this prior. 
If you pick this, you'd be getting something that is both shift invariant, this is a shift parameter, so that's a good reason to use it. And this is the transform invariant prior. So regardless of which parameterization you're working with, um, if we all use the same Jeffries rule, we'll all be using the same prior, and our analyses will be equivalent to each other. Just transform. Can we use this prior? What do you guys think? So what's the rule? Uh, if I'm testing on a parameter, be very wary of using improper priors. Unless. Yeah, so does it appear in both models? I could do the same thing to both subsets. Let's look at the base factor and think about the base factor real quick. So again, just think about the calculation maybe for a second and see if arbitrariness cancels. If we use the flat prior in our posterior estimation of theta, whatever proportionality constant I plug into the equation, it cancels itself out, so that's good. Um, let's look at the base factor. The base factor, again, is just the integral over my likelihood function, so I'll switch the notation for you maybe one more time and put likelihood in here, it doesn't really matter. Pi H naught theta, D theta, theta, and I'm gonna just write down that I'm gonna be integrating between um, theta naught and infinity, that's the null space right here. So this is gonna be prior mass on that area from theta naught off to infinity, and I'm gonna divide it by this integral. Theta naught out to negative infinity in the, the leftward direction. Likelihood function pi h1 theta d theta. So if I take the flat prior right here and I plugged in a one right here and I plugged in a one right there, you would cancel. If I pick something else arbitrary, 10 and 10, they would cancel. So as long as I ended up doing this judiciously, where I put the same amount of, the same sort of um, parameterizing, there's no parameter in here, I need a different word. The same sort of um, understanding of what, of what flat means, then this is reasonable. And so think about it, theta appears in both of these. It's not like getting zeroed out. So it's in both spaces. So regardless of the null or the alternative, theta appears, and it's some value in there. So in this case, theta does appear in both models. So you can use a flat prior, and if you think about it, it cancels out. Now, of course, if you made that one and that 10, you would be weighting the alternative 10 times higher. And that's what you would be doing, and you should not do it like that. So you should be consistent. If I think about my total prior, right here. You know, what is this thing? This is going to be the amount of prior mass that I put on the null times my flat prior right here. 1 plus 1 minus pi naught times 1 right here. And I've got to be consistent about all of this so that everything comes back to that thing right here. These are probabilities. They live between 0 and 1, so they add 1. So this thing is equal to 1. So I get back the exact same thing. Um, so flat prior is a lot. And this is how I do the comparison. So I probably would use a flat prior in this case if nobody told me anything about theta. Okay, so let's just finish writing this whole thing out right here. So my base factor would be this. Integral and I can plug right down all the normalizing constant stuff, but I'm going to get rid of it. Remember, I know what sigma squared is, so I don't need to think about it. And you might already know that x bar is sufficient for theta. So I can write down the likelihood function just like this. e to the minus 1 half 
x bar minus beta naught right here. So sorry, beta squared over sigma squared. And then I'm going to write down my prior, d theta. And I'm going to integrate between theta naught and infinity. So that's a theta that's being plugged in there. The theta naught is the boundary of everything. So same sort of thing. E to, oh, and there's an n right there. So e to the minus 1 half x bar minus theta. So this same equation, sigma squared over n, d theta. And I'm going to be integrating between negative infinity and theta naught. Let me just ask you a question. This thing right here, does it look familiar to you? Think about what this is. This is a normal distribution. Right here for x bar. And then I'm integrating over some range of theta. So what I've done is I've taken, I don't know where theta naught is. I'm not sure where this thing is. You know, in terms of the likelihood, it's peaking at x bar. Right here. This is the likelihood function. In theta naught, I'm integrating over here. So I'm taking that tail probability. That's what this thing is. This thing right here is this other direction. So help me to think about what that number is. The cumulative distribution. So this thing right here, this might be z squared. Right here, this value. Right here, that's z squared. That's just the standardized form where I end up looking at x bar minus, you know, where this thing is going to be centered right here, really integrating over that. So it has something to do with the standard normal form. And so this is going to be 1 minus that cumulative distribution. So this thing right here, this is the cumulative CDF. Everything is being standardized. Is that redundant? Cumulative CDF? Oh yeah, it's the CDF. Cumulative disk. I have a CDF. So think about what this whole thing is right here. This one is over the CDF. Right here. Where I'm looking at the CDF, this is the standardized version, so if you end up looking at this cumulative, so what this thing is right here is just the normal 0, 1, where I've standardized everything, and I'm taking that area to the right of theta naught. So this is a cumulative normal 0, 1. And I'm integrating over to that area. These are equivalent to each other. I've just standardized everything and then integrated. Anytime you have something centered in x bar, you can make it centered at 0. Anytime I have any scale to it, I can pull it out. And that's what's happening in that equation. Everything's getting auto-standardized right here. I'm subtracting off the mean and I'm dividing by the standard error of everything. What is this number right here? This area? You've taken stat classes before. I can ask a stat 101 student this, and they'll know the answer. This is the only thing they know. What is that area called? In what context do we use it? done this over and over and over again. They trained me on this over and over and over again until I just thought it was the stupid. 
stupidest idea ever. And then it popped up in days, and I was like, oh, that's a good idea. This is the p-value. This is the p-value for this test. So it is what the cumulative is. This is your one-sided p-value right here. So this right here, this is going to be at theta naught right here, theta naught. So this is my ratio of p-values. And if I ended up computing everything to the posterior probability, if I use pi naught was one half, and one minus pi naught was one half, my posterior probability would be that p-value. You can work that out for yourself. So this is a p-value ratio when there is a correspondence. Let's work through this a little bit more. But you guys have taken these standard normals and integrated over from theta naught, depending on the direction of the, the null, and computed that number, and that's your one-sided p-value. When you do the two-sided thing, they kind of get to chop that number in half. You know, we'll talk about that later. You've been using that number, but in a different context. So the posterior probability of H of H naught, this is always true. Given your data, I'll write that down as X. It's going to be equal to one plus one minus pi naught over pi naught times the phase factor. And this is going to be all inverted. Let's have a look to see that this is true. So if I just multiply everything out, I'll do one more step. I'll write it like this. 1 over 1 plus 1 minus pi naught over pi naught. And let me just write out what the phase factor is. It's the margin of the data in the two different models. So this is going to be f of x given h naught over f of x given h1. Inverted. So the margin of the data is just this integral right here. So this base factor right here is f x given h naught I've integrated over the h naught, and I'm denoting that in my notation like this. It's not a variable I'm putting in. It's notation that says where I've integrated it. I've integrated over the null space. This is the margin of the data in the alternative space. So the same way of phrasing things right here. That's what the base factor is. The posterior probability happens when I take the base factor, the posterior probabilities Sorry, the base factor is the posterior probabilities. The base factor is the posterior odds divided by the prior odds. So I'll forgive you when you get confused. Okay, so we have this thing right here. So this gets flipped upside down. I'll do one more step. One over one plus one minus pi naught over pi naught fx h1 over fx h0. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by this thing that's showing up in the numerator, or in the denominator down here. It'll show up in the numerator in a second. So this is just pi naught. Let me write it out like this. fx given h naught pi naught over fx given h naught pi naught plus fx given h1 1 minus pi naught. They're the same things. What is this? That's the probability of h naught. So my discrete portion of that. It's not continuous smearing over the space that continuous element of the prior, this is the weighting of my hypothesis. So if I wanted to weight that the alternative was 10 times higher than the null, I would do it through that mechanism. And I'd have to have strong beliefs to really do that. So this is the probability of the alternative. 
This is obviously Bayes' theorem right here. So this thing, I'm going to do the posterior flip, and that's what this is right here. And 1 minus it will be the probability of the alternative hypothesis. These are probabilities, and they add up to 1. So the Bayesian is always comparing the null directly to the alternative. If you think about what a p-value is, is doing, they're kind of doing the same thing. That if you ended up computing for this one-sided test, what is the p-value for h naught? You would end up integrating over that right-hand side. If I flip the direction of the al alternative, I'd integrate over the other side. And that's kind of nice because those two probabilities add up to one. That's called additivity. Bayesians always have additivity. And so for the one-sided model, um, so long as I pick this to be a half right here, then that posterior probability is the p-value for this. And you can work that out. And so it is just going to be this thing, and I'll ask you to just plug in the, these different CDFs so that you can see that this thing really is just the p-value. So this is going to be your p-value right here. And the Bayesian agrees with the non-Bayesian. We will be going over p-values, but I'm assuming you know what these things are since you have the prerequisites. Okay. Agreement. That feels pretty good. So I kind of like that. And so when I see people do one-sided testing, I usually think no gross disagreement with any Bayesian. We might argue a little bit about this. If I ended up picking a conjugate prior, and I weighted it in some funny way, and I came up with some tight variance around some centering point that wasn't justified, I could come up with some totally different answer. But so long as I can explain my prior adequately well, and in this case, using the uniform prior, and then using a discrete uniform prior right here, uh, we get some agreement. Kind of nice. So that kind of stuff with the CDF? Yeah, this is just, uh, yeah, exactly. It's, you can think of it as the likelihood function, what I integrated over. But if I take this thing right here, I could think of this right here is f of x given theta in h naught. Okay, so I'm going to integrate over that thing right here. So this is the sampling distribution, if you would like, in terms of x. In terms of theta, when I operate on it, it's a likelihood. But it's that same discussion that we have. I've gotten rid of all my normalizing constants because they just cancel on these two, these two equations. So I can plug in the 1 over root 2 pi, um, sigma over root n, but they would cancel out of both of these. So yeah, so what do I call this? I call it the data margin. The margin of the data under the alternative, this is the margin of the data under the null. The base factor is looking at that marginal contribution of the data and seeing how well they support the hypothesis. This calculation flips everything around and puts the measure on the hypothesis itself. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Cool. That's one-sided testing. And we will do p-values a little bit more, and I'll show you some peculiarities with them. But in this case, the name of Pearsonian and the Bayesian kind of agree, and I would say the hypotheses are kind of well established. The way you're comparing things, I'm comparing things infinitely far on the right hand side to theta naught, and infinitely far on the left hand side of theta naught. The cardinality of those sets are the same. Um, the way I weighted everything is kind of the same on each side, and so it kind of makes sense. Okay, let's do interval testing. So, one-sided testing, not too contentious. So the interval test. I'm not going to do the classical thing here. I'll give you guys a paper that we can look through together, and then I'll look through their conclusions with you. We'll plug some stuff into a computer and see how well those, this procedure operates for the classicist. We're not going to do it here right now, so maybe in a couple days. So this is for the Bayesian. 
you may not have known that Naaman Pearson Pearsonians even have a test for the interval. They certainly don't advertise it. So and you'll see why. Patrick. So were you saying that the Bayesian and the classicists agree and are the same on the one side of testing? Yeah, but our interpretation is different. Gotcha. So but yeah. And we ended up using the Jeffrey's prior in that case. And I picked pi not to be a half, then we agree. Okay. So that at least that number that we're reporting is the same number. Our interpretation is different. The Bayesian interpret that is the amount of support for the null hypothesis is a probability function, and the name in Pearsonian is interpreting that differently. So it's not necessarily a measure of support, but if you did interpret it in the one-sided case, I guess I'd be okay. There's Bayesian justification for that. If you do that for the two-sided case, you're, you're misinterpreting. We'll have to get around to that. Okay, it's nice when people agree. Okay, the interval test. So, H naught, theta is an element of some continuous interval. And if you'd like, I can say H1 is theta is not an element of theta 1, theta 2. So it's somewhere else. So really it's uh, in here, got theta 1, theta 2, H0 is here, and that stuff is H1. I think this is the test people really should be doing most of the time probably what they want to think about, you know, but then they have to think about what's theta one and theta two in the context of their problem. I've not convinced people that this is what they want to think about, probably because it's going to force them to be a Bayesian because the p-value thing is so obnoxious in this case. We'll see that later. So what does a Bayesian do? Step one, pick a prior. Let's say we're dealing with the same example. I have some collection of data, I know what the variance is, and I know how to do everything. I know how to interpret theta, I know what theta is. I wouldn't test theta if somebody didn't tell me, like, what, what's the definition of theta? Like, what is theta? So, in this case, we know what it is, it's a mean. So, which prior? Let me ask this question. Does theta appear in both the null and the alternative? for the exact same reasons as before. So it appears in the model, in both parts of the model. So, flat, yeah, why not? So for the same reasons, maybe a flat prior. Pi theta is proportional to one, I'd say in the null space, and in the alternative space, I'd say it's proportional to one. Do you guys know that the cardinalities of these two sets are equivalent to each other? The sizes of these spaces are the same. This one looks like it's going for infinity, right? Out here, and this is obviously compact, it's bounded. Do you guys know that those two spaces are exactly the same size? Somebody explain it to me that understands that already. They're both uncountable sets. They're both uncountable. They're infinitely uncountable. Oh, they're sets of real numbers. They're sets of real numbers, that's true. So tell me why they're the same size. How would you prove that to somebody? Because like if you showed this to a freshman in college, they'd probably go, you're, you're out of your mind. One is obviously smaller than the other. Or with the supermom and the maximum? Or supermom and Aubrey, the maybe the other one. Okay. Uh, the supremum and the infimum. Yes. I'm not sure exactly the argument you're, you're after. I have a different argument. You can explain it to me soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can map them all to each other. So I can come up with a one-to-one -one mapping between everything. So you could definitely come up with a, you know, something where you're taking an interval 
let's say this is theta one to theta two, and I could come up with a function that was one to one. My, my function looks terrible. So I could come up with a function probably do it with a straight line. But it's going to asymptote in a funny way. So I want something that's going to asymptote Here we go. This looks terrible. But I could come up with something that asymptotes in that direction right there into this thing. Usually you use arc tangent to do that. So I'm trying to draw the arc tan sign. And you could scale the arc tan sign to that. But there's one one mapping, so I like Jennifer's explanation. So they are the same sizes, so that's kind of reasonable. It is amazing. Okay. If you've ever taken a, a, any sort of proofs type class, this is one of your first proofs. Okay, so I kind of like that right there. So what do I do? I compute the base factor. Same exact thing. I'll take my likelihood function, it's the same function in this case. X bar minus theta squared sigma squared over n times one d theta. So I'll integrate between theta one and theta naught and theta two. And I think what I'll do, yeah, you can do this. I'll just break it up into two things. There's an easier way to do this. Negative infinity to theta one, e to the minus one half, x bar minus theta, sigma squared over n, minus one, d theta, plus theta two, to theta one. e to the minus one half, x bar minus theta, squared, sigma squared over n times one d theta. I've just broken the integral into two points. This is to infinity. I probably could have also just taken one minus down here of that thing, compared them to each other. That'd probably be the easiest way to do it. So, but you can do it like this. Get the same thing. And if I wanted to compute the posterior probability, it's easy. H naught is going to be 1 plus 1 minus pi naught. So you're forced into thinking about pi naught in here, but you can decide how you want to weight those spaces and tell people why you did it. You can compute this. I don't love the base factor because it lives between 0 and infinity, and I don't know what that means. But I have a reasonable idea of what large is when things are constrained between 0 and 1. So I prefer to do this. Now, I will point out, I've heard people say they like base factors better than posterior probabilities because they're free of the prior. There's no prior in them. And I hate that explanation. Because there's certainly a prior being used in a base factor. It's the continuous portion of prior. And that is the more important part. We'll see that soon when we touch the point hypothesis testing. So this has very little influence compared to the other part in the point case. So there is prior involved. And it's easy to think about those. Okay. So the Bayesian has an easy solution to doing an interval test. We'll look at the classical solution to the interval test in a future class. Let's get into the hard part. So for a Bayesian, these two tests aren't too hard to compute. When theta appears in both sides of the model, in both model classes, you can use Jeffrey's prior, and everything is nice. This is where things get tricky, so the sharp test. Something different. I want to just point out, and I'll be redundant, the size of that set is infinitely smaller than that set. And so if somebody was serious about asking me this question, I'd say, I bet it's that for obvious reasons. 
So again, people are really asking if you're close. So maybe you want to do the interval test. But I can't change the culture of the universe. It forces you to think about like, what theta 1 and what theta 2 is. I think that's why people want to circumvent it. Okay, so this is small compared to that. We'll see the repercussions a little bit later. Okay, so we need a prior. And let's just stick with the same example. So XIs come from a normal mean theta variant sigma squared. Everything's on IE, we know what the variance is. So that's no. If we didn't know it, we wouldn't know it in both sides of the model. You could choose your Jeffrey's prior 1 over sigma squared or 1 over phi, depending on how you parameterize. So you could use that Jeffrey's prior. Okay, so which prior? That's the big question here. We've been dancing around this question for a while. So let's just write out how a prior looks. Again, this is always going to be true. So we're always going to have this mixture that breaks it up into the two different spaces. So this is going to be pi naught times some probability distribution on each naught. I think we've already talked about what that was. 1 minus pi naught. And then I'm going to have some distribution over here. So we've had a little bit of discussion, but let's have it again. What's this? Remember what we're doing, we're just placing mass on this space. And I'm smearing mass on that space, and I'm weighting that space. But there's only one point in the space. So there's only one way to do it. This is the delta function, theta is equal to theta naught. Um, lots of discussion could happen right here. So this isn't the only thing going, and this isn't even the prior that I use in my daily research. So, but this is the one that probably people started talking about first, and this is the most popular one, and it's because it's conjugate. So a lot of people will take this to be a normal. They're gonna center it somewhere. I'm gonna write down that this is gonna be a um, theta alternative, H1. I'll write it out like that and there's going to be some variance. I will point out in this case, you are not free to use an improper prior. And we'll see that in a second. You won't have total cancellation. And it's because that cancellation isn't going to happen in both these spaces. So whatever normalizing constant I introduce here, we're not going to get the same thing out of this. This is already normalized. So when I integrate to it over that point, it adds up to one at that point and zero everywhere else. So, quick question. So a few things that we have to ask about this. And we will be discussing other types of priors. And even asymptotically, things can change a little bit. So I'll give you some results later on, but I'll show you what at least most people do and what the issues are. So let's say, just for our own mental capacity, theta naught is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the most typical test that you'll see, at least in a regression context, you see that a lot, where you'll be applying this to maybe zero amount covariance in the model. Maybe this is an intercept and you're saying it's zero. Okay, so this is probably the most typical test, is testing things that are zero. So I'll just leave it there, but it could be arbitrary. So um, here's a couple questions. What should theta H1 be? Remember what this is. This is our center to our alternative. Where do you want to center it? Yeah, probably theta not. So you probably, if you're, if you're really testing this, it would be inappropriate to say that this was 10,000. So I think it's zero. I want to know if it's zero, so I'm going to compare it to 10,000. And if it was reasonably close to zero, whatever the answer was, let's say it's 10, it's going to put a lot of support on the null. 
This is much, much closer to the thing that I'm comparing it to. So for symmetric reasons, this is a symmetric distribution, you probably want to center everything there. So answer, this is the uncontroversial part. So theta not. I would say this is uncontroversial. Thanks, question. What should psi squared be? And this is one that obviously you can't answer. You don't, you're, we're not even familiar with psi squared, you know, at least at, at human level. What is the variance? It's a hard time thinking about it sometimes. So what should this be? Let me just ask this question. Should it be small or big? However you want to interpret those two things. Reasonably small or reasonably large? Let's leave it as a question. Well, does it depend on how close you want to get? It kind of depends, right? It depends on a whole bunch of stuff. So I, I think it is a elusive question. Um, smaller. Okay. Um, I'm going to just argue probably fairly small. But it, you know, of course it depends on the problem at hand. Probably shouldn't be infinitely big. And if it is infinitely big, you're gonna have some repercussions. Jennifer, let me just get this written down. And there will be lots of questions. So this will help to guide some of our questions at least. So same thing that we always do, we're gonna compute the base factor. So what's our base factor look like? E to the minus one half x bar minus theta squared over sigma squared over n times my prior. That makes this the easiest integral in the world to do. So, and I'll just say theta is an element of h naught anyway, so I'm integrating, but I'm really just plugging in a point right here. So compared to theta is an element of the alternative, so I'll just write down negative infinity to infinity. If you would like to remove the data point theta naught from this, that's fine. Just keep in mind, when I do do the integral, it has no competing measure. It has measure zero. And so you can remove it with an indicator function if you'd like, but I never do. So because it doesn't matter. X bar minus theta squared over sigma squared over n. And now I've got my prior. And we're just going to plug it in at least notationally. So I'm just going to write down that this is going to be a normal distribution on theta psi e to the minus one half theta minus theta naught. We'll plug in a zero later on. I'll keep it more general for a second. Oops. This is going to be sigma over, this is my prior, psi, psi squared, d theta. That's my base factor. And what we want to do is we're going to want to see how is this influenced by n? Right here, you'll notice that there's no normalizing constants here because they would have canceled. But I have to be careful and include that because it will not cancel right here. And if I forgot to put it in, I would have a different number. So I have to be careful there. So the normalizing constants don't cancel. So that's our first encounter with that. And so we just need to work this thing out. We'll come back next time and spend a couple minutes chiseling away at this integral. But the numerator is exceedingly easy. So this is just going to be e to the minus 1 half x bar minus theta naught squared over sigma squared over n. In this part, we need a little bit more work. So this is an integral over a normal, normal. What does it become? What distribution is that? Normal. It's a normal also. So this marginal distribution right here, this part, fx, given h1 
is going to be some normal. And to do this, we need to complete the square and do all that stuff that you now know how to do. Where is it going to be centered? Does anybody know? Maybe not. There's not too many choices right here. You guys know what the variance is? You, do you know? Stephen? We can do it in like a couple minutes. A couple minutes. Okay, so come back after spending a couple minutes and convince yourself it's this. That's what the answer is. See if you can do it. Complete the square, and then next time I'll give you a trick so that you can do it instantaneously every single time. I haven't given you this trick yet because I want you to be able to hand integrate it. But see if you can work on that integral. We're going to write down the base factor and then we're going to study the performance of this base factor and how it performs under different n and different psi squared. And you might be surprised. That's it for now, you guys. So sorry to cut it right in the middle of the conversation, but this is going to take us all week to get it. Enjoy the weather.